Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're here with Greg and Mary today for Sabbath School. And this week's lesson is Jesus, the anchor of the soul. But before we begin, we definitely need the presence of the Holy Spirit. Greg, could you lead us in prayer? My pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath day. And Lord, we ask and pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be upon us as we open your word and as we study more about you and the principles that you want us to learn about. We ask and pray for the blessing of those who are listening and for those in our AV team who are behind all the technology that enables us to broadcast to those who are watching online. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We lift our prayers up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, so this week's lesson, Sabbath, Jesus, the anchor of the soul. We're going to read the memory verse, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I love this verse, and I actually found something at Ellen White that I may know him from page 75. Hope has been set before us, and it's about these verses, even the hope of eternal life. Nothing short of this blessing for us will satisfy our Redeemer. But, if it, is, but it is our part to lay hold upon this hope by faith in him who has promised we may expect to suffer, for it is those who are partakers with him in his suffering who shall be partakers with him in his glory. He has purchased forgiveness and immortality for the sinful, perishing souls of men. But it is our part to receive these gifts by faith. Believing in him, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast. We are to understand that we may confidently expect God's favor, not only in this world, but in the heavenly world. Since he paid such a price for our salvation, faith in the, in the atonement and intercession of Christ will keep us steadfast and immovable, amid the temptations that press upon us in the church militant. Let us contemplate the glorious hope that is set before us and by faith lay hold upon it. Wow, I love that. So let me ask you this. Jesus, the anchor of the soul. Are there any boaters here? Okay, I'm going to say no. Have you ever set an anchor? I have, and most of the time it works great, right? But sometimes the anchor will give, and the scary part is you don't even realize it sometimes, and you start drifting away from where you thought you were, just like we can in the world, huh? You will be in rocky danger or shallow seas before you know it, and in so much danger, and you won't even know it until it's upon you. So, undependable as anchors are, you know when you anchor overnight, they suggest you use two. Just in case one gives, because it's happened many, many times. And boaters, you know what I'm talking about. So, I'm thinking, if I'm setting my own anchor in life, I'm kind of relying on myself. But this week's lesson is Jesus, the anchor of our soul. And the SDA Bible commentary says about verse 19 for anchor. An anchor holds a ship in a storm and keeps it from drifting on the rocks. There are times when anchors slip, but not so with the anchor of hope. The metaphor of an anchor occurs only here in the scripture. So the only time in the New Testament is with Paul, actually in the whole Bible. It goes on to talk about this hope that we have, this hope that enters into the veil. And just in case anyone is unsure, that word veil, which is katapatamasa, my Greek is horrible, 
It is always used for the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. So if our hope enters within the veil, where is it? In the most holy place. And what's in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. And there's also the mercy seat, the throne of God. So what are we anchoring to? And I love this one. I actually read it um, from the critical commentary, or commentary critical and explanatory on the whole Bible. Etius explains, as the anchor does not stay in the waters, but enters the ground hidden beneath the waters and fastens itself in, in it, so hope, our anchor of the soul, is not satisfied with merely coming to the vestibule, that is, is not content with merely earthly and visible goods, but penetrates even to those which are within the veil, namely to the holy of holies, where it lays hold on God himself and heavenly goods and fastens on them. So what do you think? Anchoring on God, can that ever fail? Never. Never. I love the picture that Paul paints in this when he, when he goes through this, that it is so true. So in this week's lesson, we're going to look at the audience that Paul is speaking to. See how they fell in love with Christ and tasted the goodness of the word. How they fell in love with Jesus upon hearing the word. And see how it is written in Greek that when he's saying this, it's in the past tense, the aorist tense. Not in their current state or attitude. We'll look at how Paul says that they are impossible to restore. We'll look at what that means. And how did they get there? And we're going to look at something else because some people say, well, once you're lost, you're lost. But we're going to look at Peter after he denied Christ and see what the difference is. In Tuesday's lesson, we'll see how there is no sacrifice for sins left. How if you know Jesus, or at least have heard of him, he is the only path of salvation to you in this world. On Wednesday, we'll hear about the better things. If the Hebrews return to God, his audience, what will change in their lives? How they can reclaim their first love. And finally, on Thursday, Greg will wrap it up by telling us about Jesus, the anchor of the soul. I've briefly touched on this, but Greg will definitely expand on it much more. That we can avoid falling into the trap of apostasy in this world so that we may live with God in the next one. Mary, can you tell us about tasting the goodness of the word? I always love that, especially like when they eat the scroll. Yes, exactly. Well, we're studying how Paul is advancing in his sermon to deeper theological insights in spite of an audience that is dull of hearing, which is what we have read in Hebrews 5.11. However, first we want to understand what this Hebrew audience had experienced at some point in the past and we'll see it's a range of divine blessings. So we're going to read Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. So what are the blessings that these believers were given in Christ while they were faithful to him? Enlightenment, taste of the heavenly gift, they shared in the Holy Spirit, they got to taste the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. So this first blessing of enlightenment, what is this? It's to have experienced the initial Christian conversion. Hebrews 10.32 says, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. It means to have turned from the darkness of the power of Satan to the light of God. Acts 26, 18 says to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. 
It's also deliverance from sin and ignorance. Enlightenment is an act of God achieved through Jesus, who is, as we've read in Hebrews 1.3, the brightness of the Father's glory. The next two blessings listed are to taste the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit. So what is the heavenly gift that they tasted? It may refer to God's grace. Romans 5.15 says the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. It may also refer to the Holy Spirit through whom God imparts that grace. In Acts 2.38, Peter preached repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So to taste of the heavenly gift and to share in the Holy Spirit are interrelated. Paul is saying that the audience had a spiritual experience in God's gracious gift of salvation and acceptance of that gift made them partners with the Holy Spirit. The distribution of the Holy Spirit is something this audience had experienced vividly in their early phase of being evangelized. The next blessing is to taste the goodness of the word of God. This refers to hearing the gospel and accepting the good news of salvation, to experience the truth of the gospel personally. In its ultimate sense, what or who is the word of God? Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. To taste the goodness of the word of God means to invite Jesus into the heart and allow him to impact your life and your character. Ellen White has referred to this blessing as those who have had knowledge of Christ, who have felt the converting power of God, and have come to know God by an experimental knowledge. The last blessing the receivers, excuse me, the believers receive is to have tasted the powers of the coming age. So the powers of the coming age, what does that refer to? It refers to the miracles God will perform to believers in the future, such as bodily resurrection, transformation of our bodies, and everlasting life. But it also refers to miracles the believers are beginning to taste in the present, such as a spiritual resurrection, transformation of our minds, and everlasting life in Christ, which we can experience now. Paul may have had in mind the wilderness generation who experienced the grace of God and his salvation. They were enlightened by the pillar of fire. They tasted the heavenly gift of manna. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of God. And they saw the powers of the age to come and the wonders and signs performed in their deliverance. Paul suggests, however, that just as the wilderness generation apostatized from God, despite all those evidences, the audience of Hebrews was in danger of doing the same, despite all the evidences of God's favor that they had enjoyed. And what about us? Are we in danger of doing the same? I'd like to conclude with a quote from Testimonies for the Church. And this explains a little deeper this tasting the powers of the world to come. In heaven, God is all in all. There, holiness reigns supreme. There is nothing to mar the perfect harmony with God. If we indeed are journeying there, the spirit of heaven will dwell in our hearts here. But if we find no pleasure now in the contemplation of heavenly things, if we have no interest in seeking the knowledge of God, no delight in beholding the character of Christ, if holiness has no attractions for us, then we may be sure 
that our hope of heaven is vain. That's quite somber. Perfect conformity to the will of God is the high aim to be constantly before the Christian. He will love to talk of God, of Jesus, of the home of bliss and purity which Christ has prepared for them that love him. The contemplation of these themes, when the soul feasts upon the blessed assurances of God, the apostle represents these as tasting the powers of the world to come. Let's focus on contemplating upon these themes and feast upon the blessed assurances of God. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Greg. Yeah. I just like to say also, you think about that, that peace of contentment that transcends all understanding. Amen. They lost that as well. Yes, Amen. they did. And so easy for us to do the same. Yes, we are no different. No different. Greg, can you tell us about impossible to restore? Is yes. it really? We're going to find out from God's own word. Well, good morning again and happy Sabbath to each of you. And as Byron had said, Monday's lesson is entitled Impossible to Restore. So I want to begin by opening our Bibles and reading a few passages that touch on the essence of Christian life that it really is talking about our daily walk, the daily walk that we take with Jesus as he transforms us from our old self to our new self in Jesus Christ. And I know some of you are familiar with these passages, but for those of you who are new to Christianity or they've just escaped your mind, we really need to become familiar with these. So let's look at several passages. We're actually going to look at five, but they're brief. Okay, so let's first look at Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that our old man, our old self, was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Let's look at Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. And Galatians 5.24, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then the last one here, um, Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should so boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So these verses describe the process that we go through when we become believers and followers, and I should say genuine believers and followers and partakers with Jesus Christ. This is what he does in us if we let him. Essentially, we die to self daily, and the ways and values of this world perish as well. And that's a beautiful thing because the, the ways and values of this world are not desirable as we see what's going on today. So that, that's a beautiful thing that the Lord promises us. Now that we have this foundation of some of these uh, passages, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, which Mary touched on, and she covered the blessings. We're going to touch on the point that brings the title to mind, which is impossible to restore. So let's read Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. That's very powerful. So you can see it really becomes a turning point here. And this is really important for us to understand. So let's break this down a little bit. In verse 4, what we're looking at is the, um, in the Greek, it emphasizes the word impossible. And the Greek word for that is adunatus. I'm sorry, it's adunatus. That's a little bit better pronunciation. And in this context, it means impossible, could not do, not possible, impossible for anyone. 
And then if we look at verse 6, the phrase to fall away. Well, in the Greek, the word, the verb fall away is peripiptu. And peripiptu means to fall away from the true faith, from Christianity, from the worship of Jehovah. And also in verse 6, the word to renew in the Greek is anakahinidzu, meaning to restore. So to renew is to restore. So why is it impossible to restore someone who has fallen away from the truth, from the worship of Jehovah? Well, we find the answer as Paul continues in verse 6 because they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And I want to read this from Ellen White from her Selected Messages, book 3, page 415. Because I think this brings a perspective on this. Those who have given their affections to any leader but Christ will find themselves under the control, body, soul, and spirit of an infatuation that is so entrancing that under its power, souls turn away from hearing the truth to believe a lie. They are ensnared and taken, and by their every action they cry, release unto us Barabbas, but crucify Christ. So that's really what, what we're getting at here. Does this mean that if we have a bad day, or if we stray away from Jesus because we become lukewarm in our faith, or that we have sinned, or even if we get upset with God? No. The sin that Paul is speaking of, crucifying again the Son of God, it's a figurative expression. And it has to do with severing the personal relationship between themselves and Jesus. So the struggle for us today is between life, eternal life in Jesus, or death, which is in self and the ways of the world. And Jesus warns us, and these are real important verses here to keep in mind. They greatly impacted me when I first heard these. So Jesus warns in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And lastly, Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. So we're being warned, do not be lovers of this world. This walk, it's a process. It's a day-to-day -day walk. It's a battle that is not won or lost at once. It takes time. And these passages don't refer to the person like you and me that from time to time we fail or fall short in our walk with Jesus. Sometimes we do. But he's always waiting for us with an outstretched arm. Rather, the sin that Paul is speaking about is referring to the person who after experiencing in their heart and in their mind genuine salvation, as Mary had covered, has, they've experienced that genuine salvation in Jesus Christ. And what that means is they then decide that Jesus and Christianity is a threat to the kind of life that he or she wants to have. That is, they want to have a life of this world. And they decide to sever, to kill, to end the relationship with him. That's what Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 6 is referring to. Then it's impossible to renew that person because they have made their final decision. So our Christian walk with Jesus is a daily walk. And that's why we are to take up our cross daily with Jesus. And if we're willing, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will transform our hearts and our minds and our ways from worldly ways to heavenly ways to his ways. So that said, I'll turn it back over to Byron. And I love because in verse 6 when it says, have fallen away, that's an aorist tense as well. So that means they continue in the past to fall away. That it has become yes. their nature. Yes. Whereas Peter repented. Exactly. So, right. so yes, it means there is hope if you choose Amen. for hope. Amen. 
So we're going to look at when, or at Tuesday's lesson. No sacrifice for sins left. That sounds rather ominous. I'm going to read Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. And I love the title for this section in the Bible. Christ or judgment. Oh boy. It's like a rock in a hard, well actually it's uh, salvation in a hard place. But start in verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, that would be that falling away, um, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Wow. Yeah, that, that title is pretty, pretty something. But is it harsh, do you think? It's, yes, it gets your attention. Yes. So let's dive into this. Can Jesus really be the only sacrifice? We're going to read Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. And this is during the, um, the time of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat or the Azazel goat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot of the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Wow, so how, how did this whole thing happen? We're going to look in Leviticus 16, 21 through 22. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquity of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Remember, even during the sin offering, they would confess their sins and lay their hands on the goat, and it transferred to them. And then they would sacrifice the animal. So the scapegoat's going to take all that sin of Israel into the wilderness to probably die there. But still, that's the way God prescribed it. So, how do you know it worked? How did they know it worked? We're going to read from the Mishnah, the second division of Moed, Yoma number six. Had they not another sign also? A thread of crimson wool was tied to the door of the sanctuary. And when the he goat, that'd be the scapegoat, reached the wilderness, the thread turned white. And just so you know, Part of that thread was around the horns of the scapegoat and around the handle of the temple door. So once the scapegoat reached the wilderness, the thread, the scarlet thread on the temple door turned white. And they knew the temple, the sanctuary had been cleansed. For it is written, though your, your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And we know that verse. So that was God's way of letting him know the sin was done, right? It was removed. There was forgiveness. So let me ask you, what happened in um, 30 AD? They believe Jesus was born about anywhere from 4 to 2 BC, right? His ministry, he was 30 years old when he started his ministry. So we're going to say, I'll just go in between 27 AD. So in 30 AD, he was crucified, right? Well, in the, in the Jerusalem Talmud, it says, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out, the crimson thread remained crimson, that would be the one on the temple door, 
And the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand because there was a lot that was chosen for which one was a scapegoat and which one was a sacrifice. It always came up in the left for 40 years. Where are the odds? So they would close the gates of the temple by night and getting up in the morning and find them wide open. And that's Jacob, no sir, from the, I can't pronounce it, the Yarushamli, Shamli? Page 156 and 57. So this signified that the sin was no longer taken away from the temple. It signified that sacrificing animals no longer worked for the sin problem. So what does that mean? What was your only problem for resolution for sin? Jesus. Jesus. Acts 16, 17 through 18. People might say, well, are you sure about that? Following after Paul, and this is when they're in Philippi and the woman that would, the slave girl that would do divination was following after them. Following after Paul and us, she kept, and that would be Luke was with them, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of, sal of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, the demon in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. So what was the problem? Was that true? That, that proclaiming the way of salvation? But if you go to the original language and you see the little notation by the word the, it literally says a way of salvation. And the way she addresses the most high God in Greek and this came from the, S, um, from the SDA, SDA Bible commentary. It was the same way that they would regard, say, Zeus as the head of the gods, the most high God. Or they would refer to Elyon, the god of the vault of heaven to the Canaanites. So why Paul cast her out was because she was lying. No, Satan never does that, does he? There are other ways to God. This is just one. And we know that's not true. Now, I don't mean to say because some people say there are many paths to God, right? And God meets you where, they are, where you are. And if you have never heard of God, if you have never heard of Jesus, I believe that's true. But if you have heard of him, if you have received the word, God judges you on the knowledge that you have. And it's not your rule book that he goes by. When he judges, it's his. So Jesus wasn't joking when he said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So if you know that Jesus has the power to save, if you know he's the only one that can save you, why would you reject him when no one else can cure you of the sin problem? Hebrews 10, 29 says, How much severer punishment do you think you will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God has, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? In other words, the sacrifice is no good. It's flawed and has insulted the spirit of grace. What do you think will happen to you? Do you think Christ will profess you to his father? Or will he say he does not know you? There will come a time, and the Bible says, where those that are unclean will be unclean. And those that are righteous will be righteous. So, Jesus is your key to salvation. Draw close to him. Embrace him. Embrace the gift, the free gift that he's given in his sacrifice of his blood that cleanses us and makes us white as snow and hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit who is here to guide you on the path to salvation. That is really what we wish for everyone, to come to God just as you are so he can make you something so much better. Amen. Mary, can you tell us about Better Things, Wednesday's Day lesson. Yes, I can. 
after Paul's strong and sincere warning in verses 4 to 8 that Byron just shared, he culminates with an affectionate, encouraging statement. In verse 9, he says, But beloved, we are confident or persuaded of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So he's confident that they are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. How delicate Paul is. He warns, but only to encourage commitment. He challenges, but only to assure them that they indeed can receive the wonderful promises of God. So let's continue reading Hebrews 6, verses 10 and 12. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. How is Paul encouraging them here? Well, first he mentions that God acknowledges their work and labor of love shown toward God by their acts of ministry to the saints, which, by the way, the Bible identifies as believers. That's what saints are. God notices their continued ministry towards believers. These aren't isolated acts in the past, but sustained acts into the present. Is this a lesson in character building? Do exceptional acts reveal the true character of a person, or is it consistent acts? The stronger evidence of love towards God is not religious acts per se but loving acts of kindness towards one another, and especially those who are disadvantaged. For this reason, Paul exhorts believers not to forget to do good in the closing chapter of this book of Hebrews. Secondly, Paul goes on to state that his desire is for each of them to show the same diligence of hope to the end, Hope is not kept alive by intellectual exercise of faith, but by faith exercised in acts of love. And he warns against becoming sluggish or dull or lazy, which characterizes those who fail to mature and who are in danger of falling away. And lastly, Paul encourages them to imitate those who have exercised faith and patience and have inherited promises. So who do you think Paul is referring to here? In chapters 3 and 4, he presented the wilderness generation as a negative example. They lacked faith and perseverance, and the result was they failed to inherit the promise. As we continue reading in verses 13 and 15, we'll see who Paul is referring to here when he says to imitate. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Paul brings up Abraham as one who through faith and patience inherited the promises. And he expands upon this list of positive exemplars in Hebrews chapter 11, but in chapter 12, he culminates with the greatest example of faith and patience. And that example, of course, is Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, persevered patiently the cross, 
despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So in this study of the lesson, we've seen that God hopes better things for us that accompany salvation. He desires that we show diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end and that we follow and imitate those who through faith and patience will inherit the promises. Jesus is our supreme example of that faith and patience. And as we near the end of this earth's history, let us remember the characteristics of the saints in the last days as described in Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By God's grace, may we continue to hope for and strive for these better things that he has planned for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Greg, tell us about Jesus, the anchor of the soul. Sounds good. I think this was one of my favorite days of this week's lesson. I just, I got so much out of it personally, and I hope that each of you will get a lot out of it. So Thursday's lesson, as Byron had mentioned, is Jesus the anchor of the soul. And it sounds like a statement of fact based on a promise. So when we make a promise or an oath to someone, it may be expressed in the form of a contract, either an oral contract or a written contract. That's pretty binding, right? Well, do these contracts have an inherent weakness? Sure they do, because they're made by us, men and women with sinful natures. And this, of course, is evidenced by lawsuits in our court systems on a daily basis. And it goes back from biblical times to today. We break our oaths, we break our commitments, our promises, even in the most basic forms. Fortunately, that's not so when God makes an oath, a promise, a contract with us, with humanity. So let's dig into scripture a little bit further to better understand God's ways of keeping his oath and why Jesus is the anchor of the soul. So let's return back to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. So I'm going to read that for us. Thus, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immu immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's unpack this a little bit. God tells us that he wants to show more abundantly the immutability of his counsel. So the unchangeable fact that he is God and that his ways cannot change. That is, Love, truth, and freedom of conscience. Those are God's ways. In the Greek, immutability is the word amatathetos. And amatathetos means not to be transferred, fixed, unalterable, unchangeable. And the two things that are immutable, because we have to remember, God doesn't lie. First is God's counsel. In the Greek, the word for counsel is boule meaning advice, purpose, and in the Greek lexicon, I found this very, very interesting because it specifically talks about this verse in Hebrews, and it means all the contents of the divine plan. Second thing that is immutable is his oath, his promise, but the oath in the Greek is horkos, and horkos means that which has been pledged or promised with an oath that we might have strong consolation. That's peace, that's assurance. And we get that peace because of the assurance that God gives us. God provides the refuge. Who's the refuge? Jesus. It's Jesus. To lay hold of the hope set before us. 
And Ellen White tells us in her book, Bible Echo 1900, that this hope is eternal life. This hope is an anchor of the soul that is both sure and steadfast. And that hope is Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, our forerunner, and our high priest. So God keeps his oaths, his promises in two ways. Again, first, by his word. Again, remember, God cannot lie. And secondly, by the evidence fulfilling his word. So in the beginning, if we go back, in the beginning, God made an oath to Adam and Eve after the fall. Let's read Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We could spend a lot of time on this, but that seed we know we're t- it's talking about Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate seed. Then God revealed more details about the original oath that he had made to Adam and Eve by further revealing more specifics of the oath and its, full, and its fulfillment to Abraham and to David that through Abraham's seed, his offspring, let's read Genesis 22, 17 and 18. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And he also confirmed this with David through David's seed. Let's read Psalms 89 verse 34 through 37. My covenant I shall not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness. So God is saying that once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever. Like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky, Selah. So this oath, both to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, and to David, was to be fulfilled through their seed. And that ultimate seed is Jesus Christ. This oath, it wasn't only for the Israelites, but for the Gentiles as well. It was for all of humanity who are of faith. For all nations shall be blessed. Let's look at Galatians 3, verses 6 through 8. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham before saying, in you, not just your nation, not the nation next door, in you all the nations shall be blessed. And the New Testament confirms this oath that his seed, this hope by faith is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Galatians 3 verses 14 through 16. And that blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So Christ is the seed. He is the seed. And the evidence, the proof that this is fulfilled, that God fulfilled his oath, God guaranteed he sealed his oath by seating Jesus at his right hand. So Jesus resurrected and he ascended into heaven as the forerunner on our behalf as Hebrews 6.20 refers to. His resurrection and ascension into heaven reveals to us the certainty of God's promise of salvation for us. Salvation is assured in Jesus Christ. Jesus' presence before the Father is the proof. He is the anchor of the soul. Jesus, who is our high priest, our forerunner, and our hope, is the anchor of our soul. This is the proof, this is the seal that God keeps his oaths. Unlike us, he keeps his oaths. So remember, God cannot lie. So 
what more assurance do we need than that? So that said, I will turn it back to you, Byron. God wins every lawsuit. He does. <laughs> He's undefeated. Yes. Thank you, Greg. So we see that, and you know, especially from the beginning, that anchor being in God that we have. So I want to read some final thoughts from Ellen White, The Sign of the Times, January 3rd, 1906. The only begotten Son of God came into this world to redeem the fallen race. He has given us evidence of his great power. We, he will enable those who receive him to build up characters free from all the tendencies that Satan reveals. We can resist the enemy and all his foes. The battle will be won. The victory gained by him who chooses Christ as his leader, determined to do right because it is right. Our divine Lord is equal to any emergency, any storm that we may face. With him, nothing is impossible. He has shown his great love for us by living a life of self-denial and sacrifice and by dying a death of agony. Come to Christ just as you are, weak, helpless, and ready to die. Cast yourself wholly on his mercy. There is no difficulty within or without that cannot be surmounted in his strength. That's the God that we have. Do you place your hope in him? Are you anchored in him and his surety? If you sin, repent. He's waiting. If you backslide as they did, he's waiting for you to come back to him, just as Peter did. If you abide in Christ, you can handle anything with him. And that anchor in God, it will never break. It will never break free. But we need to hold the line. Because if we let the line go, we will go adrift. And God gives us an infinite amount of line, but we have to grab hold of it to hang on to him. Are you willing to hang on to him? To hang on to that anchor, to his promises, his surety, and his love for us. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, with humble, contrite hearts. Lord, we are weak. We are powerless. And anything that we think we have, as Paul said it before, is rubbish in this world. Lord, teach us that we may see you, that we may look to you, that we may and our weakness be strengthened by you so that your power, Lord, may be manifold in this world so that we can see, have that first love that Paul talks about, that we might have the taste of those powers to come and the joy that it is to be with you. Lord, help us to find those that have fallen away, those that have given up on you, Lord, those that, that think they don't need you because, Lord, Without you, there is no life. Those that know you know there's no life without you, no real life. Help them change their ways, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may transform them to come back and be the sons and daughters of the living God. Help us all to surrender to your will and to let you fight the battles because, Lord, you've already won the war. Teach us to trust you in faith and to hold fast to the anchor in the throne room of God that saves us from every difficulty. We thank you for the Sabbath day, for the time we have to spend with you, Lord, to grow in you, that we truly may be transformed into the likeness of Christ Jesus. We pray this all to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, and our anchor. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.